morning, LifeBridge. Great to see you here in the room and welcome online. Great to have you with us. It's good to just take a breath, isn't it, after, after such a troubling week. So grateful for Matt leading us to start the service and how he leads us in praying for our community. But to take a breath and refocus in worship and to remember that we have a cornerstone, faithful in the midst of the storm, a firm foundation, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I'm ready to dig into his word this morning and remember the truth about me because of his word. Are you ready for that? And we have a message of redemption this morning. So take a deep breath as I take a drink of water here to start with. Actually, as we start this message, let's raise a glass. Here's to the liars, those who bend the truth just a little bit. To the dishonest who misrepresent themselves. To the weak ones who tend to fold like a cheap tent when strong winds blow. Here's to the prideful who tend to sell anyone up the river in order to save face. Or here's to the overconfident, those who think they always have the answers and they're the strongest and smartest in the room. Here's to the cowards, those who lack the courage to endure. Friends, here's to us. <laughs> have you ever broken a promise? And if you just answered in your mind, no, then you just did. And didn't you always promise to, to, tell, to tell the truth? It begins when we're small, when we're toddlers, and starts with promising not to eat the candy or go near that thing we shouldn't go near. And then it moves quickly on to not looking at that or reading that. Or we promise our first crush that we will love them forever. And then it grows to not driving too fast or not reading that text while driving or then, then promising not to tell, not to use what we know to get what we want at the expense of another. And then the, there's the vows that we break when we weren't able to keep our word or assurances. We all break promises, right? I'll always be there. I'll never leave you. I'll always love you. Just being with other humans teaches us about broken promises. And it's the ones we make to ourselves that we tend to break first. I will always, I will never, I will only, I will absolutely, you fill in the blank. I'm sure I promised somebody that I'd never leave Australia. I know I promised my parents that I'd always tell the truth. I did promise my, my wife, Mandy, that I would love her from that day forward. And there have been days that I haven't loved all that well or been that lovable. This room is full of broken promises. That room you're watching from, that room you're listening from is full of broken promises because you are in it. And we are human, which means we are heroes and we're hopeless. It means we're winners and we're losers. It means we're courageous and we're cowards. One of my favorite singer-songwriters, the late Rich Mullins, penned it beautifully when he wrote, we are frail, but we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Forged in the fires of human passion, choking on the fumes of selfish rage. With these our hells and our heavens so few inches apart, we must be awfully small and just not as strong as we think we are. Well, neither is our character from the Bible that we're going to dig into today as we round out this pre-Easter message series, The Criminal, The Coward, and The Conspirator. And this particular character from the Bible is one of my favorites. It's Jesus' follower and apostle Peter, the fisherman formerly known as Simon Peter, who Jesus invited to become a fisher of men. And what an adventure that turned out to be. He was one of those guys that wore his heart on his sleeve, always spoke his mind, never left you wondering what he was thinking. You know anyone like that? He was a risk taker, a dream builder. He was courageous enough to throw out his net one more time against all odds. He was confident and just crazy enough 
to step out of the boat and walk on water. And if you're new to the Bible, look that one up in Matthew 14. It's an amazing story. He was bold enough to believe that Jesus was who he said he was. But he was also a failure, a runner, a sinker, a denier, and a coward. And also the rock upon whom Jesus revealed he would build his church. And one can be forgiven for wondering if Jesus might have had a better plan. I've worked in and for and with churches for nearly 30 years now. And when things get messy and complicated in the church, which they invariably almost always do, I often find myself thinking of the lovable yet often fickle character of Peter and wondering if he was a clue that the church was not going to be perfect, was not going to meet all our needs. And it's when we focus on the imperfections of the church and not the perfection of the one we worship that we sink, just like Peter did when he focused on the storm and not on Jesus. So why is this fallible fall guy Peter responsible for the establishment of the early church? Why is that? Well, maybe it points to this divine, mysterious partnership that God is actually inviting us all into to move his mission forward in the world. He doesn't need us, but he desires to partner with us to make that happen. And aren't we just as unreliable as as Peter? Well, there's clues for us today in the passage that we're going to dig into as to who and why Jesus calls who he does. And there's hope for cowards like me and you and him. We're going to be in Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, if you want to turn there or look it up on your device. I want to give you a bit of context first. A couple of chapters earlier, Jesus has ridden triumphantly into the city of Jerusalem. He's been hailed as king, people crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're throwing their cloaks on the road. He's riding on a donkey. They're waving palm branches. He's continuing to fulfill all kinds of Old Testament prophecies and continuing to embrace his mission and purpose. It's what we now know as Palm Sunday and it ushers in what we now know as Easter week or Holy Week. And what is today? Today is Palm Sunday. A great opportunity to reaffirm Jesus as King of Kings and Lord of Lords in our hearts. To prepare ourselves for Easter week as we remember the greatest act of love and sacrifice in history that changes everything. So that first Palm Sunday was then followed by a week of stories and parables and teachings and miracles and drama that led to the highest life-changing, life-altering drama of all with many subplots. Earlier in Luke 22, Jesus has shared his final supper, the last supper with his followers. Matt talked about it a couple of weeks ago, setting the table for what we now know as communion that we that we celebrate each time we meet together and remember what Christ has done like we just did. And then that led to Jesus revealing that one of his followers was going to betray him, which led to a lot of this. In verse 22, the, the disciples asked each other which of them would ever do such a thing, which then led to an interesting conversation about who was the greatest among them. I don't know how that happened, and it's a dangerous topic in the, in the presence of the greatest servant of all, which then led to our exchange today between Jesus and Peter here in Luke 22. I'm reading verses 31 to 34. Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat, but I've pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you've repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you and even to die with you. But Jesus said, Peter, let me tell you something. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. So this subplot represents one of the most momentous moments in the history, early history of the Christian church when one of its great leaders is about to fall flat on his face, a pattern that sadly repeated itself over the centuries up into the present day. 
And why is it momentous for the early church? Not because of what Peter did or what happened to Peter, but because of what we can learn from this situation. Simon, Simon, Jesus says to Peter. He calls him by his former name, not the name Peter himself, not the name Jesus himself gave to Peter, which in Hebrew meant stone or rock. Why did he call him by his former name? Is it because he knew that Peter was about to act like he did before he met Jesus? Or is it simply a teacher trying to get a student's attention with an important information? Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. This is probably the most perplexing part of the passage for me. And if I'm Peter, I'm like, oh, wait a minute, what? can you repeat that? Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. Well, tell him no. Or maybe Peter in his overconfidence and his lovable arrogance is like, bring it on. But there's a nuance in the passage here that should make it feel really personal for us. It's two words, each of which tells us that that word you in the original translation was plural, meaning that Satan didn't want to just sift Peter. He wanted to sift all of Jesus' followers and attempt to separate us like wheat from chaff from Jesus. And Satan asked, reminding us that God is the ultimate power, but why would, why would God allow this? Is it because he wants us to know that we're not as strong as we think we are? Is it because he wants us to know that he is stronger than we think we are and stronger than Satan and our trials? Is it because he wants us to know the full force of his grace? Or is it because he wants us to live in the tension of not knowing? Flip with me for a moment to the Old Testament book of Job for some context here, where there's an upper and lower room drama taking place where Satan is in essence, asking the Lord to sift God's faithful servant, Job. In chapter 1, Satan says, Look how rich he is, but reach out and take away everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. All right, you may test him, the Lord said to Satan. Do whatever you want with everything he possesses, but don't harm him physically. So Satan left the Lord's presence. Here we have precedent for Jesus' words in Luke 22, as all hell breaks loose on poor old Job in that lower room drama. It's an intriguing read. If you haven't read it, go read it later. But what do we do? with a God who allows us to be sifted like wheat. Well, for those that have already chosen to follow Jesus, we do what only we can do. We, we trust him and we test him. And we do what Peter did on the Sea of Galilee in the midst of the storm in Matthew 14. And I encourage you to read that too if you haven't. And reach out to Jesus. Listen to this in verse 30. Matthew 14, but when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and he began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why do you doubt me? I used to hear that in an accusatory tone, but now I hear it in a loving tone, like a loving older brother or a parent. And one more observation on Job before we leave the Old Testament and head back to Luke 22. It's from Max Licato. He writes, all his life, Job had been a good man. All his life, he had believed in God. But in the storm, Job saw God. He saw hope, lover, destroyer, giver, taker, dreamer, deliverer. Waymaker. You know, it's often not until the sifting or the storm that we truly see who God is because the light shines brightest in the darkness. 
That was my prayer this past week as I watched the news and saw events unfold. Lord, let your light shine in the middle of this darkness. Are you in a storm season right now? Are you in a season of sifting a dark season? Then I encourage you to to reach out to Jesus because make no mistake, he's always reaching out to you. He's never passive, always active, evidenced by his next words to Peter in our text today. When he says, Simon, I've pleaded in prayer for you that your faith should not fail. He is active and activating heaven on our behalf and in our situations. How do we know this? Because he prayed for Peter before Peter denied him. And so he is praying and interceding in our situations. Don't doubt that he wasn't active when that was taking place in Boulder this past week. Listen to these words in Romans 8. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Print that on a magnet and stick it on the refrigerator door of your heart and watch your attitude defrost. Memorize that picture. I love John Piper's words. He writes, The almighty power of God guards us for our eternal salvation by working in us the perseverance of faith in answer to Jesus' prayer. I love to think of God the Father and God the Son collaborating in our salvation. So whatever mess you're in, about to be in, or desperately trying to avoid, God is trusting you like he trusted Peter to be faithful in the middle of it. He's praying that your faith will not fail even when you do. Because we all do. At some point, we're all colossal stuff-ups, fakes, failures, frauds, cowards. Even when we puff up our chests like Peter and say, what? Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you, even to die with you. Mate, who do you think you're talking to? Well, Jesus wants us to know that he knows who he's talking to when he says, Peter, let me tell you something. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you'll deny three times that you even know me. And he knows us too. We are frail. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Forged in the fires of human passion, choking on the fumes of selfish rage. With these our hells and our heavens so few inches apart, we must be awfully small. And we're not as strong as we think we are. So fast forward in Luke 22, verse 54. So they arrested Jesus. And they led him to the high priest's home. And Peter followed at a distance. The guards lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat around it. Peter joined them there. Just bookmark that picture of the fire, the crackling, the smell of the smoke. A servant girl noticed him in the firelight and began staring at him. Finally, she said, this man, he was one of Jesus' followers. Peter denied it. Woman, he said, oh, I don't even know him. After a while, someone else looked at him and said, you, yeah, you, you, must be, you must be one of them. No, man, I'm not, Peter retorted. About an hour later, someone else insisted, this must be one of them because he's, a, he's clearly a Galilean too. But Peter said, man, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. At that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Can you imagine that look? Suddenly, the Lord's words flashed through Peter's mind before the rooster crows tomorrow morning. You will deny three times. You even know me. And Peter left the courtyard, weeping bitterly. What do we do with this? We know what Peter did. 
He went back to being Simon. He tried and failed at the big fisher of men story, so he just went back to the fishing for fish one. You ever been there? You tried living God's biggest story for your life, but life demands deadlines, limitations, expectations all got in the way. You tried living your best self, but you just went back to your old self because it felt safe. Old habits like comfortable old shoes. You went back to fishing. That's what you thought you knew how to do. It's like Peter's going back to fishing and apparently he's not even catching any fish, which makes you wonder whether he was really any good at it to start with. Well, you can't dig into Luke 22 without jumping over to John 21 to find out how this all resolves. John 21, verse 3. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. I can imagine he may have said, fellas, I'm, I'm going back to fish. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Jesus has died on the cross, risen again by this point, but Peter's busy being Simon because he clearly doesn't feel useful, usable, dependable, or reliable. So he's gone back to fishing and not catching any fish, which is kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy, don't you think? Until early in the morning, verse 4, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, ha- haven't you any fish? No. No. They answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. You see, when Jesus is involved, even what you used to do gets redeemed. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he'd taken it off, jumped in the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. This is a great picture. They're so close to the shore, but Peter's so excited. He can't even stay in the boat at this stage. He's jumped out. He's trying to run and wade through the water. It's like that picture of the prodigal running for home or a great Hollywood movie at the end where that's that race across town when reconciliation, redemption and recommitment is at hand. When they landed, verse 9, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. The fire, remember the fire, the crackling, the smell. Jesus engages the senses to take Peter right back into the situation. So he has to face this. He has to face it. Jesus said to him, bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Remember, Jesus prayed for Peter before he denied him and now he's serving him afterwards, not with reluctance or or disappointment, but with love and reassurance. Is Peter getting all caught up in the excitement of the moment or is he starting to wonder, oh, what's Jesus going to say next? Well, here it comes. When they'd finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you you love me more than these? Yes, Lord. He said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you, you know all things. You, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. There is so much meaning and symbolism packed into this conversation. It could be a whole other talk or message. In fact, Matt and I were talking about how it could be a whole other message series. 
But I love this observation from Richard Foster. He writes, God goes with us in the examine of our conscience. This is equally important for two opposite reasons. Before this situation, I think this first reason applied to Peter. If we are the lone examiners of our heart, a thousand justifications will arise to declare our innocence. We will, in Isaiah's words in chapter 5, call evil good and good evil. Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you, even to die with you. That was Peter. At the other end of the spectrum, if left to our own devices, now, after this situation Peter's been through, it is easy for us to take a good look at who we are and declare ourselves unredeemable, totally unredeemable. Restoration, redemption. Here on the beach, Jesus is handing back to Peter his self-worth, his purpose, his mission. As he asks him the same question three times, three times Peter answers the same way, maybe each time erasing each one of those denials. Because when you think about it, Peter betrayed Jesus two more times than Judas did. We're the ones that assign severity to the sin. And I find it interesting that by the third time, Peter's kind of getting a little put out, a little hurt. I'm like, come on, Peter, just, just go with it. But maybe it reveals to us his deep love and affection that he has for his Lord. The fact that Peter's going, why do you have to ask me three times? Or maybe it's not until the third time that Jesus finally realizes that Peter has stopped listening to his shame and starting to remember that he's loved. Are you getting the message this morning? Then he follows that with two words. Follow me. Follow me. And those two simple words give Peter focus for the rest of his life. Refined by failure and fire. Simon becomes Peter again, the rock upon which the church will be built. And we are here today in part because of this conversation. And Jesus even preempted it in our text for today in verse 32 when he said, when you have repented and returned to me, strengthen your brothers. Because there's the application of those two words, follow me. Love and strengthen your brothers. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Love others. Do you love me? Strengthen your brothers. The strengthened becomes the strengthener. So what do we do with this? We do what Peter did. We show up. We just show up. That was the way Peter always was. He showed up and he just trusted God to do the rest. It's how he was when he left everything and followed Jesus. It's how he was when he stepped out of the boat. It's how he was when he stepped into contentious conversations and challenging circumstances. He showed up and he trusted Jesus to do the rest. And the Bible is full of flawed heroes of the faith that just showed up and trusted God to do the rest. Noah showed up, God built an ark. Abraham showed up, God built a nation. Moses showed up, God delivered a nation. David showed up, God slayed a giant. Mary showed up, gave birth to God's son. John the Baptist showed up and baptized God's son. List goes on and on and on. And then Jesus, Peter shows up on a beach with Jesus and finds forgiveness. And Jesus gives him a life alterating, kingdom building, world changing mission. And he's no smarter, braver, stronger or more dependent than you or me. Are you getting the message? This New Year's Day, Mandy asked me if I had a word for 2021, which is going to kind of be like my theme, like some of you like to have a word for the year. And just as I'm responding to her that I hadn't really thought about it, the word growth popped into my mind. Along with this personal response, "Uh uh-oh, because growth means what? Challenge. Growth only comes through challenge. It's what I tell my boys when they lose a ball game to a better team. You grow most through your losses, through your failures and your challenges. Big challenge equals big growth. Sore today, strong tomorrow. It's on our oldest bedroom wall. 
Mercifully, there was another word that started to, to come up for me in the, in the following weeks, and that word was favor. The favor that can only come from God. The writer of Psalm 90 declares, may the favor of the Lord rest on us, establish the work of our hands for us, establish the work of our hands. And that's what's happening for Peter here on the beach. He shows up and despite his shortcomings, the favor of the Lord rests upon him and establishes his purpose and mission. Why did Jesus choose Peter? Why does he choose, use, bless, and call any of us? He doesn't tell. He just does. He just does. I got a lot of questions for God that he doesn't answer. And the older I get, the more I'm realizing that the growth comes in the not knowing, in the trusting, and in the showing up. Showing up even when you mess up. Showing up even when you don't have the answer. Showing up even when you don't know what to do. Showing up even when you don't know what to say. Showing up when you don't agree. Showing up even when nobody else does. Showing up even though you don't know how you feel, but trusting God to show up with you. Moses in the Old Testament was invited by God to show up and he complained about it for a while, saying, I don't know what to do. I don't know what I'm gonna say. I don't know where to go. And finally, he asked God the question, and who will I even say sent me? I am is sending you, God answered. Moses asked the question and I think he spent the rest of his life trying to work out what the answer meant. Meanwhile, growing into one of the great leaders in the Old Testament. How is God inviting you to show up right now? It doesn't have to be huge. It could be in small ways. But he's always asking us and inviting us to show up in some way. Is it a conversation you've been putting off? A situation you've been trying to avoid? Is it a a challenge that you don't feel equal to? to meet without falling flat on your face? Is it a step of faith? Is it a step into faith? God is always inviting us to show up. Think about that for a moment. Here's to the liars, those who bend the truth just a little bit, the weak ones who fold and the tough winds blow the dishonest who misrepresent themselves, the prideful who sell anyone up the wherever to save face, the overconfident who think they have all the answers, the cowards who lack the courage to endure. Friends, here's to Peter. Here's to you and me. Most of all, here's to the Saviour who took all these indictments, these accusations, who took our failures and our flaws and our shortcomings and our sins. He took them up a hill and he crucified them on a cross with his own life in love for you and me so that we could know the redemption and the forgiveness and the second chances that Peter knew on that beach so that we could know life everlasting and know that we will never have to show up alone ever. Right now is the best time to respond to the questions that Jesus is asking you. And they're the same questions he had for Peter. Do you love me? Will you follow me? And if you want to answer yes to those questions for the first time, please let us know. Text the number on the screen. Find one of us here. We'd love to talk to you about what that means, about next steps to take. Or maybe you've said yes and you want to take that next step of baptism, that outward expression, that inward confession of faith. We would love you to join us next weekend. We're going to baptize a bunch of people Easter Sunday. It's going to be a party. We would love you to be part of that. Or maybe, or maybe you're back on the beach. You messed up. And you need to say yes again. Nobody who's ever come to Jesus seeking forgiveness in their heart of hearts ever walks away wanting or disappointed. We are welcome at his fire anytime. If that's you, we'd love to pray with you and celebrate with you because we may be frail, fearfully and wonderfully made. We may not be as strong as we think we are, but you know what? We know 
that we are loved. Nothing can change that, diminish that, alter it. He loves you this much, this much. And He is always reaching out to you. But you can't grab a hold of His hand when your fists are clenched around things that are defining you and limiting you that He has already died for and set you free from. So as we prepare for Easter week, would you join me in a prayer of confession and some more worship as we open our hands to Him? If you're comfortable, would you stand and just open your hands to Jesus afresh today as we close in prayer together? God of grace, we open our hands to you. We meet you in this moment of confession here in this place on the beach around your fire. We confess that we've left undone the things we should have done and we've done the things we shouldn't have done. But we rest in the truth that you are the Lord of mercy. We pray for your forgiveness, that you would restore our hearts with the truth of your love for us and your sacrifice. We say yes to your freedom and your invitation to follow you as we respond to your call in your open arms in this moment.